Well, good morning, fam. It is another Freedom Friday, and you are still not free, but hopefully after this hour, you will be freer than you are now. This is another episode of Unpublic. Today, as always, on Freedom Friday, we have Sharif L. Mecki. How you doing, Sharif? Great, man. Good to be here. Went outside this morning, feed the chickens. Feels like summer, bro. Like 65 <laughs> degrees in Philly. Like that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful morning forecast, you know. So probably humid, probably get some rain or something, but it felt good, you know. You know, Sweet. things are sad when 65 feels like, you know, yeah. Oh my God, it's <laughs> oh, summer. <laughs> this is it. This is it. Yeah. But over overall, things are going all right, man. Things are going all right. That's how you know you live in in the uh, in the north. Oh my God, it's sixty five. I was out <laughs> feeding the chickens, and I was out back, you know. And I'm looking at my pictures from my people down south, and they've been doing that for a while now, right? Oh, yeah. Like they've, you oh. know, they've been wearing shorts and stuff. I'm still yeah. this. I'm still wearing a a, a hoodie because it's still cold. Mm. Uh, oh, I should show you my hoodie. This is Check. today's show is brought to you by the University of oh, Ohio. Hell no. no. School hell of no. Parentology. <laughs> School of Parentology, bro. Like, so, listen, sign uh, up. Sign I up. Guarantee you, if you are a black parent in the United States, there will be a point in which you will attend the University of Ohio. No. School Make sure of you Parentology. Throw that, in, throw that link in the comments, man. <laughs> um, well, listen, today I wanted to talk about um, data. I wanted to talk about information and data um, statistics and education mm. only because of a very simple reason. It's not, um, I don't want to have some big explosive, you know, this is how statistics work. No, um, I'm baffled by the response that I get when I talk about the importance of test scores. And when I talk about the importance of third party data, mm -hmm. like information, and the reason that I'm baffled is, Every time it comes up with educators, there's almost a uniform answer in the educators that are responding to me. So I, I don't want to make it sound like it's everybody. Um, but I, I do want to say that it's pretty uniform response. Those tests are unreliable. They're invalid. They don't tell us anything we don't already know. Um, show me your zip code and I'll tell you what those scores should be. Um, all those scores tell us are the, the education of parents and their income level. And as a parent, as a layperson, at a, as a citizen, as a taxpayer, as somebody on the outside, I find that to be number one, anti-education, because you're not educating me on anything, really. I find it to be a little bit um, insulting because you're, you're explaining to me that you literally believe that my zip code, my race, and my social economic status uh, should determine um, whether or not my kid can score a 50, an 80, or 100, a C, a B, or an A, whatever, um, which in itself is, is. So here's my thinking about it. And this is why it's good to talk about it with you as an educator, as somebody who's been a school leader and has seen this from that perspective. And I'm talking from a parent perspective. It's like I need some something physical in my hand that I get back from the school district that that looks objective, right? That kind of, how's my kid doing themselves? How are they doing in comparison to other kids in their school, in their state, and in the country? And, and I even like the data around how as a country are we doing versus other countries, right? Like, like um, all that to me is data. It's just information, but it's so controversial that, that we can't even just have like an, an honest discussion. So I just want to start with the framing of I'm coming at this as a parent who believes in third party verified information that doesn't come just from what the educators do, because I don't trust educators. Mm. I just want to be real with you. Right. We have too much research about who is teaching our kids and what type of attitudes they take with them into the classroom for me to consider it intelligent to say, oh, just trust them and just trust th the test that they devise. One, I have a historic and a racial reason for not trusting them. Mm. Two, I have another reason, a professional one. They are not psychometricians. You can't tell me that the test, the, the, the unstandardized tests that they're creating for my kids are above reproach, right? Like that, that I should just trust it. Like they've got my kid's best mind, you know, uh, best, best interest in mind. The other part, Sharif, and this is what I'll end on, 
is all that I have been told by ed reform theology for the last 10 or 15 years is that data-driven instruction is what turns schools around, mm. right? Getting everybody on the same page, getting them a common data set, and then having them use data to inform daily, weekly, monthly, and so on as a way to, to understand where their kids are and then get them to where they need to be. And as recent as this week, I talked about Karen Chenoweth's work, um, who makes the point that data is, stop being afraid of data. Stop acting like data is the enemy. Like it's the, the thing that you, it's like you can't do without it if you're trying to improve students. Mm -hmm. So there's my long-winded opening of, I don't really understand um, the, from the parent position, I'm gonna say in data I trust. Right. Like, I don't have to fight you. We don't, you know, we don't have to uh, get into why I distrust you or whatnot. If we have data, if we have data, then data tells truth to me. Um, but uh, I want to understand it also from the other side. So so it, did you find anything in there that you would want to respond to in just in the opening? I mean, you, you said a, a, a lot, man. Uh, I know, I always do. It's a, it's a lot. So I'm trying to, I was, as I, I was like, well, I was trying to, you brought up something else. I'm like, well, I need to. So, I mean, I'll just say in, in general, like, you know, part of, you know, part of, uh, I would just draw caution to folks who is like, oh, we don't need data. And, and how you describe like, oh, you know, if I know your zip code, I'll know generally what your test scores are. Like that is that is kind of the pervasive mindset that uh, gets our children, black children, uh, you know, lesser value in their educational experience. And what I mean by that is if you if you continue that thread, that logical, you know, in, you know, in Iran, I used to take a logic course <laughs> like if this and then this and this, just, mm -hmm. you know, to see the patterns, identify what are the patterns in people's you know thoughts or in their uh, arguments. That same pattern is what gets people, uh, black people, uh, black schools, black, you know, educators come into our communities and say, well, this zip code, I mean, I don't need to try too much because I've already created this constricted thinking in my head as far as like what you're capable of because you live in the zip code. Right. And I, I spoke before multiple times about like Yvonne Savior, you know, Pennsylvania teacher of the year who ended up being my instructional coach and many other black men who came through the Concerned Black Men program to become teachers. And she would, you know, interrogate our biases, push us to interrogate our biases and see, can can a child in this poverty, you know, uh, in this zip code, in this school and, you know, with this type of parent, with this type of experience, can they achieve at high levels? And are you willing to be accountable for them? And so I was I would just like couch it there, like a big part of, you know, uh, t a test. And no one's saying like the test is absolutely perfect. But, you know, when we talk about the achievement gap, the achievement gap is actually the preparation that teachers have to teach those children in those zip codes or with, you know, with if it's a single parent home or if it's this or if it's whatever it is, you have to look at ourselves first and have to say, like, I don't want a third party measure. And mind you, many of many folks are creating poor tests. If they're saying, I'm not ready to teach, I'm not prepared to teach, then how are you prepared to create a test? Mm. <laughs> you know, that's my mm -hmm. thing. Like you say, I'm not ready, mm -hmm. I was not prepared to teach. Most new teachers say that, that their undergrad did not teach them. Then who taught you how to? But you can test. I can't teach, but I can test. My test is better than uh, you know, the NAEP or you know, the state. Now, what people do with tests how they use it as a lever, if they even use it at all to inform. Um, and we can go, like, it really depends on how deep we want to go with assessment. The best teachers are assessing all the time. As they're teaching, they are assessing. They, My best teachers will have a clipboard and say, here's what I want to measure today, <laughs> you know, based on this objective that I told the students, I want them to be able to master or move closer to mastery of this. And I'm, I'm checking, I'm going around, I'm listening to whether the child says it, whether they write it, whether they respond to somebody, I'm checking. He has it, she almost has it, she nailed it. That's assessment. Mm -hmm. Like that's mm -hmm. what's happening mm -hmm. with the best team. Many of our teachers can't even do that. <laughs> then they say, but also don't, you know, don't test this. So it's, it's like- But, but again, now when you say that, that's mm -hmm. data, right? That's, that's data, data driven. Exactly. That's being data driven. That's data driven. So no one should have a problem with that. But people do. Right. They have a problem even with that part. Listen, some people just are like, 
Remember when, and you've probably seen this in a bunch of different times, where people said we need more data on how the police are stopping and frisking black folks. Police like, we don't need no data. We don't need that, right? There's a way where there's a little bit of like, oh, your your uh, your draws are showing, whatever the term is, right? Like the, your slip is showing. Like when when mm -hmm. that kind of transparency occurs, and if we're and so you have to really look at what are people's intentions? Are they trying to hide from transparency? Are you know as bad as Nick, uh, No Child Left Behind was in many different ways, un unfunded mandates and th all that kind of stuff. What it did say was you have to disaggregate the data. You have I to mean, show that's like such a great example, though. I mean, what if the police were to say to us, "We don't need body cameras and we don't need any more data because all it's going to tell us is." how poor you are and what district you are like we yeah, you, expect like we already black, know it's gonna be more we're gonna arrest more y'all because y'all black yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. Like or we're gonna stop you more often because that there's the correlation or because like there's even like right now in the comments there's a couple of things that i think hit on kind of my sore spots with this like michelle johnson says um yes the belief gap is wrong which we can agree on but in many ca cases um uh, it, it the standardized testing just tells teachers what they already know they don't I hear know teachers it. say that all the time. I think that's a lie. They don't I don't think it. it tells them what they already know. I can't I can't stop any of my kids, several teachers right now, and have them say, tell me exactly how my kid is faring against kids in your class and the class next to yours and in the district and in the state. And they're going to say, oh, yeah, I already know that. Let me tell you. Let me Without the test, let me rattle off to you exactly how your child is doing in relationship to, number one, their own potential, what they could be doing, versus... Um, them versus other students in the class, the school, the district, the state, the country, and the world. It's a lie that they that there is no educator right now. I dare an educator in my comments right now to say, I can tell you all 35 of my kids or 150 of my kids exactly where they are with perfect precision just because I have them in my classroom and I teach them on a daily basis. Some of whom never raise their hand, some of who get an A on this and an F on that, and you never go back to it because you have 150 kids. I actually just don't, as an outsider, a non-educator, a parent, I don't trust it. And I, I, I trust it less that an educator would think it's logical to tell me that you already knew that my kid was going to get an 85 or 100 or whatever. I just, what am I missing there with that? It's so prevalent for his teachers to say that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a, a part of it is one, you know, people, you know, people center relationships are absolutely extremely important, right? Like that's one. So I think it's a complicated, uh, you know, seething cauldron of, of various conflicts, <laughs> you know, oh. that's seething cauldron. So one, people will rather talk about their relationships with students than how much students learned while they were with them. Right. The relationships like the feel good part of relationships but they can't tell you I leverage that relationship to get, you know, to help this child achieve their highest potential. Mm -hmm, Here's where mm -hmm. they were missing. And I leverage my relationship in order to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like that's a you know, that's an important part. You know, the second part, like, you know, how are you teaching without understanding what skill? What are the discrete skills that make up the whole? What are the specific parts? What are you like? The, how are you assessing what exactly where a kid is struggling? Right. Because you could just give a math problem. Right. And this is like the complexities of, you know, like our best teachers. This is what they're doing mm -hmm. in the moment mm -hmm. as well as during their prep time and after school, even like whenever. Like this is when they're looking at like, all right, why exactly? What is the skill that this child needs to uh, support with? Like even just reading. Right. You got phonemic awareness. You got phonics. You got fluence. You just take a, a, a score and just say, oh, this kid knows it or doesn't know it, you're going to miss the important parts. You have to understand it deeply in order to be able to do that. And certain, and, and I do get the pushback on how people use assessments, but my, I have to push back against that. It's like, don't just tell me like, oh yeah, that's, that's not perfect. When you have nothing, you, you can't show me anything better. <laughs> like you can't show me anything that you're doing that is better. You can't show me those kind of receipts. And I think it's much easier for people to band together and like, hey, no test. Like, and I just, I, I don't understand it. Like I, you know, we, you know what? In the mm -hmm. Thomas Tassa is all black school. Any test they put in, we were able to skip grades. We were able to come in your schools and we, it wasn't all about testing. It was about us living up to our fullest potential. 
being mm-hmm. rigorous and relevant in their in their teaching. And we're able to come into their schools and skip grades to oh, like we're all graduating at 16 years old. Like that was the norm. That was the norm for us to graduate high school once we got into public school, because our school was a K to six. Hmm. When I went to Iran, mm-hmm. every the whole country took. I mean, one thing, it wasn't 50 different tests. I can tell you that, like every province had their own thing. It's a national <laughs> test. That's right. They've nationalized the they, test. They national we can't said, do here. Yeah, yeah, it was like their NAEP where we kind of sporadically put it here and, and draw a conclusion from that. It was like everybody takes the NAEP. And then we want to see like how folks are doing across the list. We had to take it in geography and history too. Like it was a national test of geography, national test of history. So like there were standards that teachers were using to figure out, okay, this is how I'm going to uh, teach. Anybody who anybody who teach younger grades, running records, they're telling you, oh, this is how they, I'm, I'm testing their reading skills and the, how they've mastered it. And if they're able to move up and what's the just right instruction. Mm-hmm. But all of a sudden we're like, well, that doesn't apply to anything else or anything else about my teaching or, or nothing. And I still I'm just always stuck on if you're not prepared to teach, how are you prepared to do all these other things that you are against? Yeah. I'm just you know, yeah. I got to send you that flyer so you can just put it up on the screen so folks can see it, because it is I mean, it's it'll make you, you know, a raving lunatic <laughs> to look at that and then draw all these conclusions like, yeah, we don't need to do nothing once we get to schools. It, it doesn't make sense. And well, nothing's yeah. perfect. <laughs> nothing's perfect. And how well, people use it is important. I think that's the rub. If we're being honest, it's how people use uh, test scores. That's the real mm. problem. Mm. People are attacking the validity of the test. They're attacking the the instrument itself. They're saying it's any number of things: invalid, inaccurate. The the uh, um, Becky Pringle, president of the National Education Association, has been tweeting for the last several days. Uh, these tests, let's just get rid of them. Let's stop it now, because that's not something that they always wanted to do anyways. It just, you know, it's just weird that it, you know, well, because of the pandemic, let's just go ahead and throw out blood pressure tests and asthma tests. Listen, and, they're revisiting you know, their, their game plan. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're like, like, hey, their what, game plan what is do? no accountability, mm-hmm. right? Like, like they, they, so anyways, the, the test is invalid, she says. It's unreliable. It's unscientific. Does it doesn't she give a reason? Any, does she well, give a not not a reason? I'm sorry. Does she say here's how we can, here's what we should be accountable for? This is the growth of students that we should be looking at. No, Completely she said graduation it, their pitch said is really trust teachers. Their pitch is is really that your educators know best, your teachers know best, your teachers are with your student. Stop trusting politicians and third party corporations and people who design tests. Stop trusting them because your teachers know best. Um, they're the most trustworthy. They see your kid every day. Um, there is no problem with their performance. There is no problem with their understanding. There is no problem that the majority of the teachers in the United States came through low rent colleges that had very low expectations that didn't prepare them to teach and that they learned most of what they learned on the job. And they learned it in very random ways across 14,000 school districts. And some got more of it and some got less of it. And we have this very uneven profession, this profession that doesn't wanna be nationalized that doesn't want to be professionalized in total. It's kind of just do your own thing locally. So if you're in, you know, Albuquerque versus in Idaho somewhere, you could have two totally different sets of teachers doing wildly different things and different levels of competence and performance and abilities. And they're all psychrometricians, right? They all have the ability to, to they're the ones that you should ask whether or not data is good and, and whether or not instruments, the instruments are valid because that's their background. After you know four years and then a licensure program, their background is in psychometrician. So just just trust them. And you know, just on top of that, there is no um, no mistrust that you should have based upon the data that says that they adultify your kids. They they punish them more harshly. They don't see them as very bright when they actually are. They actually have a problem with ver- uh, verifying their giftedness and getting them into gifted programs if they're black. Like you should just bypass that. Just trust your teachers. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's this whole kind of like more than a score um, marketing. Like they want you as a parent to get emotional. My kid is more than a score. 
Tell that to if, your if goddamn you bank. Tell that to your credit score. Oh, but you if know, you need go, an go advertisement to tell you that, that, like, that's, it's, you got deeper issues than, than a once a year test. I mean, <laughs> somebody, if like, that has know. to, nobody has to convince me uh, that my kid is, is uh, you know, more than a score. Like, that's not it's even a conversation. So like, that, like, it's so not working. Your, your child is you know? more than their <laughs> sneaker size. <laughs> like, no <laughs> shit. Like, what are you talking? Why, why, why are we even talking about that? Why are you bringing up sneaker size? Right. Right. It's, I mean, is I, my child, this is what I want to know. Is my child more than the alphabet? Is my child more than them star words? Is my child more than like uh, understanding of how to compute? Is my child more um, more than an ability to be able to to decode complicated texts and understand the country that they live in? Because you telling me that like, oh, my child's more than a score. That's emotive. It's emotional. And I want my parents thinking like intelligent human beings after all this time, because oppression is real. Marginalization is real. And these phony little silly kind of slogans that people throw out there to make you emotive about, yeah, my child should be more than the score. They should be able to fail out of everything because they so cool. You know, listen, listen, that's not what you're thinking about for your own children. And I know it. So don't try and pull. Don't. I'm not going to be bamboozled and hoodwinked by you who work in a system that want me to believe that your your poor results are OK, because my child is more than a score. Listen, I'm not having it as a parent on the outside. I am trying to understand. I do want to know, like, help me understand as educated people who are educating other younger people, like as a profession. How can you be so anti-science? This feels so QAnon. <laughs> this feels so Pizzagate. It feels yeah. so weird to me. I mean, you know, it's it's interesting too. So, like when I was a uh, did a fellowship at the U.S. Department of Ed, right? And you know, so part of the work was to go with some of the high ranking officials and you know go wherever. So I went with the Deputy Secretary of Ed once to this conference, and I'm like, you know, my job is to kind of read the crowd, take notes, have small groups afterwards, see how it resonated, all, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know, whatever his speech was. And this one guy stood up and was like, I want to tell you, uh, I'm anti-testing. Y'all give all these tests. <laughs> da, da, da. And then, and she's like, well, you know, the federal government just uses this as a civil rights tool and we only require it once a year. Like how many tests are you getting? He's like, he starts naming all these tests. She's like, well, you know, your fight is actually with, your district in school. She's like, and you haven't even talked about how many tests you give as a classroom teacher. When he started thinking, he's like, I actually am the one that's testing more than, than everybody else combined. And then the next question was, how do you use it? And I mm -hmm. think that is a big mm -hmm. question for everybody to answer. Some folks give tests so they can have sit down, shut up time. You know, some folks are less like, hey, this is how it's part of my class management, you know, uh, tool, not let me see how they're learning and growing and what I can do better. Right. Some folks test kids are asking a month later, yo, what was the, what were the results? Like, do we have a score yet for that test? Like, you know, what's going on? It's like, oh, it's still in my trunk. I didn't, how'd you plan? <laughs> how'd you plan the next week? Well, you know, it's just, I'm just, we're just teaching, you know, I mean, we're just teaching, but I, I think a, a big part of, you know, all of this and that we can't separate like, yeah, people get, you know, crazy about the test. You know, I, I told you a long time ago, my, my daughter, when she was in elementary school, you know, this teacher had the nerve to part her lips and tell my kid, well, you're, you're Muslim. So don't y'all have something against testing? Maybe your oh, father will no. opt you out. Oh, like, listen, bro, no. I was just like, you know what? Like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> right? Like, so she, they're like looking for, cause it, you know, you, you can opt out if you have you know, some kind of religious belief or something like parents can opt out. She was trying to, you know, coach my kid who's in elementary school, mind you. Like, let's just see where, you know, what else can we use to? And I was just like, yo, this is out of, you know, out of pocket. I ended up writing a blog and a letter to the school, you know, and just t talking to my daughter about like, listen, this is uh, this is about what you're able to do, but it also gives me overall impact. And it, it doesn't sum up everything. It's not perfect, but it gives a snapshot. Like here's a standard. Here's how that you did in this snapshot of time about, about it. Right. Because if not, we even see in grading, we see grade inflation. If we can see grade inflation because the relationships, I know them, the assuming, you know, the pushing up, right. So grade inflation in one way, 
but then lowering standards in another way. And that's mm -hmm. the school system that, that many of our children are navigating. Right. Like, and so that data piece, and we're talking, and I know people are like, oh, test score, test score. We're actually, he opened up talking about data in general. Right. So Chris is yes. talking, we're talking about data in general, like without the data, I, I tweeted out an article today that was based on a report from PCCY here in Philly. And some of you talk about all the time, like the number of black and brown kids who are in suburban schools. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's stuff that we know. And this is this is my pushback against folks who say, like, well, we already know it. Yeah, I know suburbs could be hella racist. But in order to really draw out the pattern and put interventions, I need to know exactly how this racism is showing up. Is it showing up in, in low expectations like you see in the opportunity myth where eighth graders are getting fourth grade work? If I don't have any kind of data, how will I how will I know? Right. These kids are being taught by that PC. So why puts out a report like, hey, suburbs well, are hella racist. Right question about that, um, mm -hmm. Sharif. Like, like, because that point right there hits on it for me. So opportunity myth, that report that came out last year from TNTP that showed that um, the majority, like 80 something percent of black kids are not getting grade level assignments from their teachers. Mm -hmm. Generally, they're getting assignments that are several grade levels beneath where they should be. Not even, not even like aspirational, but what they're qualified for, they're getting less that. So even if they're behind, they're they're not even getting where they are. Like so they're, they're not even reading, getting where they are. They're in the yeah, eighth so, grade, so, so. reading on a sixth grade level. They're not even getting sixth grade material. They're getting, they're getting fifth fourth grade, grade, right? Yeah. Fourth grade. Yeah. So my Crazy. point around that is the only reason I bring it up is, did you guys know that before TNTP got the data and did the report, before they looked at ten thousand assignments across multiple schools and had a thorough um, vetting of all those th that information, all those uh, assignments. Did you know that? Yeah. Because you keep telling us that you know stuff. Like, we already know this. We don't need any testing. We don't need any data. We don't need any of this. We already know. Well, okay. So did you know that you have been giving, you've been serial givers of low, <laughs> low expectation assignments to students? Did you know that? It, it, so now when I find that out as a parent, because I'm not a, you know, like, listen, I'm a person who reads this stuff and thinks like, you know, like it's voyeuristic in some ways. I'm like, this is what's going on. Like as a, you know, as a person outside of the building and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, how could that go on so long with all these people that know every damn thing? That know everything. That, that just, exactly. You just know every damn thing. How could that go on for so long? That's my we, question as a, we, as a taxpayer. Because what they say is. We already noticed because they're in the zip code. Does that explain that? Like why you're giving fourth grade level stuff <laughs> right. to the eighth grader because of their zip code? Yeah. The achievement gap is really the gap <laughs> between the adults, between one ear and the other ear mm. and, and the potential of these black and brown children. Ooh. Right. So that Ooh, PCCY okay. report, right, says it's a black child quoted in it is like I had to demand and push to have access to AP scores. And we saw this in other mm -hmm. research. We mm -hmm. saw this in the data where if the scores were the same, the black kid was still likely to get access to the rigorous course. Still, even if the test scores were the same, because it could like, uh, I don't really back to that belief gap. It still comes back to no matter what it is, whatever it is, it comes back to the belief gap. What do you think about that child in the community that sent them to you? Yeah. Okay, so I want to put this up here because it's the best representation I could find of a teacher um, who uh, um, who exemplifies the the resistant attitude that I'm talking about here. So gadfly oh, this on the guy, walls. This guy that this, <laughs> his school uses data to keep black kids out of his school. Like so, like <laughs> no, actually, I don't know. If that's true, because that, actually, that's not Stephen. Uh, no, no, you're thinking of, of Gary Rubenstein. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry. So sorry. yeah, Gary, yeah, Gary Rubenstein, Rubenstein is yeah. is and and Stephen uh, Singer is a lot like him, except for Stephen Singer is a um, is a union leading leader and a teacher who specializes in theater of the absurd. When it comes to this, is like this is the prototypical teacher I never want my child to have. All wrapped up in the social justice language, total unionist, protecting bad teachers, and himself works in a school where nobody's reading and nobody's learning. I pulled up the school. I pulled up the data. I actually went back and forth with him on it once or twice. And the bottom line was just, we should just like make sure that their parents have jobs and and be social justice -y, but there's nothing social justice -y about them actually learning because, of course, you know, 
I, I know the income level and the, the race of the kids, you know, we shouldn't. So this is, uh, we shouldn't focus on that. This is his, his blog post on the six biggest reasons or biggest problems with data-driven instruction. He sets it up by basically saying, you know, if you're a teacher, you have probably heard this data-driven nonsense a million times and, you know, and all lessons should be based on test scores and whatnot, and we should just resist this and 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 fight it. It's total nonsense, and it doesn't uh, take much to see why. So here are his reasons. The data is unscientific. That's the first one. Uh, when we talk about data, we're talking about statistics. We're talking about a quantity uh, um, computed from a s sample or a random variable. So he goes into this thing about how data is unscientific. Uh, it has never been proven effective. Administrators and principals want teachers to base their instruction around test scores, which is just like a crude misunderstanding. And it's a if lie. That, yeah, if, a yeah lie. if that's literally your understanding, stop teaching. Quit mm -hmm. now because you don't have the cognitive motivation to make it happen. And if so, you're a principal doing that, turn in your certification. <laughs> well, if you're a principal, fire this dude because honestly, you need teachers that understand what data driven means, right? It's harmful, stereotype, threat, and motivation. Data driven instruction essentially involves grouping students based on their performance on standardized tests. And, and he's basically saying, and then malign them as the ones that are racially. Um, you, you know, behind or, or so I, I get nervous. Behind, so. I, I get nervous when I see a cop, even if they're going the opposite way. You know, with a siren right. going, so I should stop driving, <laughs> right? Like, you know, yes, there are some folks who have stereotype threat, but it ain't because of the test. It's about the oppression and the racism that they feel. It's about the reality. All the other yeah, days, so they right. like the, we're not going to address that. But oh, this impacts how you do, and it might show like oh, okay, right? <laughs> you know, so like, come on, come on. So data doesn't capture important factors. Um, it's dehumanizing. Um, it's contradictory. Uh, it's not how we determine value in other areas of life. Data isn't. Like, like data is not how we, god damn. Yeah. Like stop twilight, teaching. I'm twilight, sorry, I, I, I find it hard. Redlining was data. Where do black people live? All right, here's the here's the here's the red line around it. Where do white people live? Oh, this that's data. Oh, here's the green. Here's the green line. This is a person who's teaching our young people. This is a person who has a job to teach our young people, and this couldn't be, in my estimation, as a taxpayer and a parent and as a person on the outside, couldn't be more scary to me that this is the way that you frame the issue about data in general. It's not how we use information on the outside world. If you are a community member who's an activist who's attempting to uh, secure freedom for your people, you are data driven. You want to know how many cops, uh, how often something happened, what are the number of incidents, um, how did they happen, where did they take place? Give me the information, I'll turn it into data, and I'll turn that data into activism, right? But the best way to, to defeat my attempt to become free is to erase data or to dismiss data as unimportant. We don't need to know the number of audits that the city of St. Paul did where they sent out a white couple and a black couple to try and rent apartments and the number of times that the black couple with the exact same qualifications for renting were given a higher price or told there was no, no apartment or whatnot. You know when that information came to light, you know what the city of St. Paul did after three years of it being very embarrassing in the newspaper? They stopped doing the testing of that. They didn't like the outcome. They didn't like that every year it was being shown that that the city of St. Paul had a racist system of landlords that were giving different prices and different answers to couples based upon their color, not based upon their trustworthiness or their creditworthiness, right? Mm -hmm. So the so what the landlords wanted to happen was get rid of the data. Let's just not have any data. When you deal with police contracts, guess what police officers want you to do? Get rid of the data. They don't want you to know how many times they just stop and frisk black and brown kids because you would look at the numbers and you would go, well, wait a second. Number one, it's all black and brown kids that you're frisking. Number two, it's not yielding anything more that then. So it's it's proving that you shouldn't be doing it. It's actually proving that like it's not yielding any type of outsized uh, um, benefit for stopping and frisking this group of people. No, let's just erase the data. Right. Let's erase the data on high blood pressure. 
Um, let's erase the data on anything that we find germane that we test for. Anyways, this is me ranting only because I don't get educated people who want to be educators who believe that data and just understanding numbers of things is like some sort of bad science, some sort of voodoo, and we should just trust you and your instinct. When the guy who wrote this, by the way, is in a school where all the data is bad, I can understand why you wouldn't want the public to know your data. Yeah. And I, and I think, and, and people, you know, people who are listening, you know, I, I hope you don't conflate when we're saying we need better data and we need data that, that the only thing we're saying is, oh, more tests. Like that's not what we're saying. Like standardized tests is a part of the data, but like an actual dashboard should include multiple things, particularly for black children. Like what do they need? Right. Like, and it, all of it's not uh, some easy way to measure. Some of the data will come from their surveys or their performance or their ability to demonstrate that they have self confidence or able to do self advocacy. There's, you know, it's not going to be a standardized test for every single thing. Um, but to remove that totally. So, we're talking overall about like data, like how do you become a data informed decision maker? How do you become a data informed school? How do you look at data? What it allows you to do is see patterns. See mm -hmm. patterns. How do I address it? How do I funnel resources? I think some of the pushback on standard, again, taking one, I was about to say Farsi, nukte, which means like one point out of data and saying like, oh, all you know, data, data, look, because standardized tests are bad. Like, listen, again, a lot of educators are giving tests every Friday around this country, you know, when we're in person. Maybe it changed, you know, uh, virtually every Friday. Many folks were not using it well. First of all, they were teaching um, the data shows that t uh, folks were not being taught at their ability level, let alone aspirationally. Um, data was not being used to design lesson plans or mm -hmm. craft questions or, you know, develop the unit maps, you know, in the trajectory. None data was not being used to, with any of that. And my, my point is, where's the line of demarcation? If most new teachers are saying I was not taught how to teach. And then you get into the classroom. At what point do you become this expert on designing lessons, designing curriculum, designing uh, assessments, uh, formative and summative, right? Like at what point, like where is it that, where did it happen? Was it the teacher lounge? Was it just, you know, just frustration? Was it from Gadfly's blog? Like when was it <laughs> that you actually learned how to do this? Because it was yeah. one of the troubling things, particularly in our children, not only are it, it, their schools being underfunded, not only do they have less experienced educators, but then I also hear this 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 train, which is around the same thought. Like, I don't want to be observed. They can't observe me. They don't know. Da 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 da. I don't want to go to a PD because that PD da 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 da. <laughs> right? I don't want to be. I'm just like, where does this train go? Like, where where's the the end game for this? You don't want to be observed. You don't want to uh, attend professional development. You don't want assessments. Like, where does this train go? And don't say you just want to teach because you also said over half of you said like, oh, yeah, I don't know how to teach. And the, and a significant number uh, show that I have racial biases. You put all of that in the pot. Mm -hmm. I got I got problems. I got I got problems. I need some kind of <laughs> I need some right. kind of way to, to uh, see. Are these children able to get to the standard? It doesn't mean like only teach to the t like you should have standards, but the standards aren't even just good enough for my black child. Like I, that's why I expand. Our community has to expand. What are our standards and getting the feedback? What is your child? What are your aspirations for your child? What is the child goals? Let's create some standards mm -hmm. around that. And ain't none of them going to say like I actually don't want my kids to know how to read well. Like too much, you know. If they can sound it out, all right. But I don't want them to know too much. No parent is going to say that. So mm -hmm. expand the standards, don't shrink it. And I don't want to hear about teaching to the test. See what the standards are and find out from the families and the communities what other standards that they have and then design some kind of performance base really for you to see, all right, am I meeting that? You know, so that, that know, can start early on. Let's make this concrete too, Sharif. Mm. If you're a person like me who's worked in social services um, and the story you've heard me tell a million times, one of your jobs at a certain point in your life, in my lifetime, was helping people fill out job applications because you were helping them find work. And then when the applications are done, you look at them and you got to ask for another application from the employer, from someone like Subway or Arby's or Taco Bell. Mm. You have to ask them for another one. And you get into the habit of, 
well, can you just give me asking the managers, can you just give me like five or six? Because you know, you're going to have to redo a couple of them. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're asking yourself, you're seeing somebody wrote um, that they graduated from high school and they have a high school diploma. And you're asking yourself, okay, so I'm helping you fill out an application on which you've put that you're, you've graduated. You have a certificate of completion, <laughs> like a, a diploma, a high school diploma, and you can't complete this application for a job that is not going to feed you, a job that is not going to help you beat poverty. And here I am helping you thinking to myself, like, you mean in 12 years, in 12 years, there's something that took place. There's some magic force that took place that they were not uh, that that 12, maybe to, to 20 or 35 educators in your life in that 12 years weren't able to get you to the point where you could fill out this application without any errors, mm -hmm. without any misspellings or errors or any problems. Um, at very least, I would think that that could happen. Now you see where my thinking comes from, where I get really angry because I'm like, everything you're doing is wrong if you can't at least do this. If you can't get a person graduated um, with the ability to fill out a subway application without any problems, I don't care what you think you know about data or testing or pedagogy or whatever, because somehow, like I need it to add up to at least you being able to fill out an application to get a job that's not going to pay you enough to live on. Right. That, that's that's even below my bar. That's like mm -hmm. beyond the lowest bar. So where was the where was the person catching the data at some point saying there's no way we can have you get through 12th grade without knowing how like <laughs> at least to be this much in touch with the language that I, I'm only using that as a concrete example of the consequences of a system that constantly makes it OK to perform the way it's performing right now. Yeah, right. and it's not it's not new, you know, like uh no, it's not new, you know, and that's that's the issue that it's not new that there is a general uh desire, whether it's within the schoolhouse or outside of the schoolhouse, there's a general just lack of desire to be accountable for outcomes of black children, whether that's you know, city level, state level, federal level, in the classroom, outside of the classroom. There's a general, you know. Uh, anti-blackness um, that seeps through everything, every aspect, you know, everywhere, all the institutions that are supposed to support, you know, um, you know, human life is <laughs> supposed to provide some kind of guardrail so that people do not fall off the, the track totally, um, who cannot fill out a, a simple application, who have less access, have like it, it seeps through everywhere. And so, mm -hmm. you know, and we every time I hear a critique about anything, I also have to look at it as like, OK, how does this fare with the anti blackness that's also there? Right. And so if someone says, oh, no, you know, because I'm, I'm always just like, how do you want to measure folks, you know, children's growth and who, you know, who's accountable? Like so often, you know. Oh, it's the kid who's accountable. It's the parent who's mm -hmm. accountable, right? And so far, you know, it was even a, a recent study that people put out, like, who's they named everybody except the educators, you know, which to me is pretty <laughs> damning, right? Like, they named everybody. These were from educators. Yeah. None, yeah. The yeah. vast majority of them did not say, oh, we have to do a better job. And I'm just, I've just always been curious about that. Even for, as a 21-year-old, Listening to uh, Yvonne Savior ask us about, you know, can a child in whatever condition achieve at a high level? And our answers were resounding. Yes. I mean, these were concerned mm -hmm. black men and mm -hmm. we were not educated. You know, I was on my way to law school. I just got sidetracked the past 28 years. Right. And many others were career changers. But for some reason, we had this belief about our children because we saw them. We knew them. We were them. <laughs> right. Mm. And so having that kind of context it doesn't mean that other people can't develop it. And it doesn't mean that everybody that looks like the children, uh, you know, don't harbor some of the, you know, the the anti blackness. But what I am saying is that if you don't believe in that child, it doesn't matter whether you have an assessment or not. Mm. At the end mm -hmm. of the day, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they get an assessment is going to confirm what you thought. Right. That's where it's like, oh, well, I, this is causality, you know, not correlation. Right. Like is it be like, oh, this is caused because. You're black. You you simply you're black. So you're going to be poor. You may have a couple exceptions like there are folks who believe that. So why would they try harder? That's why a, would they try to perfect their craft? Um, 
self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. It's like, oh, I already, I already know believe this that. about you. I already believe this. That's so why, why am I going to try to get to perfecting my craft? Yeah. Why am yeah. I going to try to see, you know, and it goes back to that freedom school, uh, you know, model that we talked about before. If you believe you're training your replacement and you have love for the community and like who's going to lead and serve and, and be in these spaces after you or even mm -hmm. while you're there, mm -hmm. you're going to have a very different approach to all this and doesn't mean and again we're talking about data overall not like oh do we need more assessments or less assessment we're talking about like what's the data and don't tell me like oh i just know i just believe because all the other mm -hmm. research as you said you know you can fill up you can fill compendium after after compendium about the the negative images that that educators have about black children and black communities and then just say yeah. And also don't don't well i just want to i want to get back to a couple of things like my from my negative parent perspective number one you're not an educator if no one's becoming educated in your classroom so i just want to start with a few basics like stop telling yourself you're the expert in everything and that you understand the entire world and that we just don't get it parents just don't get it politicians just don't get it philanthropy just doesn't get it people on the outside just doesn't get it. you guys just don't get it we're the experts if you are in a classroom calling yourself a teacher and nobody's learning, you are not a teacher and an ed educator, you're a student of education. You are a student of education all the way up until the moment that your people, the people that you're in charge of, start learning. And when they start learning and they can demonstrate that learning and that learning sticks and becomes building blocks for the next grade up and the next grade level, that's when you become an educator. So I think we're using the terms, we're giving away the term too quickly. We're giving, we're giving students of education um, the title of educator without them having to demonstrate the fact that they've done. Now, every way in which that we attempt to say, well, is there a way in which we can prove that the kids in your classroom are learning? Every way in which you attempt to prove it comes under fire. Is it growth? Oh, well, you know, growth measures don't tell you like blah, blah, blah. Okay, it's not growth. Okay, all right. Well, was it what they can, you know, at the end of the year when we test them, is it what they've remembered and they can do? Oh, no, no, no. Those those tests are racist. They're, you know, the, the instruments are bad. And, you know, what if a kid's just having a bad day that day? Well, I mean, are all the black kids having a bad day and all the white the kids having a good day? The same moment in time. Yeah, like, like yeah. you know, like, goddamn, like, is a bad day like a racial thing or, you know, a zip code? Well, how could everybody in 5, 6, you know, 103 be day. having a bad day on the same day? 180 you know? days of bad days for black kids. You know, yeah, so I mean, goddamn, you know. Well, you know, um, so it's not growth. It's not this. Um, is it any one? No, not one particular kind of test. It's just the three million individual tests that teachers give that you can't um, study in any um, empirical way. So let's use that because that leaves you with a just trust us. And how many times in this, you know, in, in this do I have to say that's not the rightly related relationship between communities, marginalized communities, and in a system of education that has done them harm. The just trust us, we know what's best, we love your kids, even as your kids are graduating, unable to apply to Subway. Um, just trust us. It's not, I'm sorry, that's just not going to work for me. I know, Sharif, you've tried to say a couple of times in this show, stop, you know, it's not just about the test or the one test. I want to quickly just say in Minneapolis, um, the teachers complained about the number of tests often and the union and the district worked together to create a list of all the tests that they were being made to give to kids. And it turned out to be like 30 or 40 tests. It was a lot. The number was pretty high. That's extremely and, high. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But see, here's the problem, Sharif. Does that, that doesn't include their test, right? Well, no, it does. The, the problem was that only um, one of those tests was demanded by the state and the federal government. Uh -huh. And the other 29 were tests that teachers in different groups had created themselves and were using. And the union said, we're gonna have to go back to them and say, we just can't have teachers creating tests all over the place because, you know, uh, basically, the union was saying we have to go and take strip them of that ability to do that. Now, that was a weird fight to me because now your union is telling you the, te you know, it, it just got too much for me. It's like, oh, y'all just fight all, every different direction in here, don't you? <laughs> like, like y'all just <laughs> y'all just hate um, um, peace, don't you? Um, but the majority of the tests were teacher created tests and they were not standardized. 
and we could not va validate them. We could not say that they were valid. We could not say that they were reliable. Um, we could not say everything that they say about the one Pearson test of the year that's given by the state that has been vetted by thousands of educators by the time that it, it comes to a city near you. Um, we couldn't validate any of those. And it was a struggle to say, okay, you say you want, we, but the real goal for them was to get rid of the accountability test. That was the only real goal. It wasn't that we were over testing, wasn't that we had too many tests. It was really just, they didn't like the one that would embarrass them at the end of the day. Yeah, you know, and I, I think, and this goes to, you know, uh, I used to tell my students, cause somebody used to tell me, you know, don't, um, don't raise your voice, improve your argument. And so I would say that for all the folks who are just like, you know, anti, 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 like what's better than anti is actually creating something, sharing something, having some compelling data, you know, sharing. So like for me, my question, like, hey, listen, if you're in this state and you get that test, like, and I, I would imagine that many districts have something very similar to what you described in Minneapolis, 30 plus tests, um, test all over the place, right? Um, my thing is two things, like what are the, what is the standards? What are you trying to teach? What do you think that students should know? And mm -hmm. does that match mm -hmm. up with the communities and the students themselves, right? Like what are students saying? Like, I wish I knew this, where do I go to learn it? Is there any space for them to learn it? Right? Like, so in all of that, that's one thing. Like second one is how are you going after you figure out like, okay, this is what needs to be taught and learned and, and mastered uh, some level of proficiency. Uh, how are you going to hold yourself accountable? If you're the educator, if you're getting a paycheck every two weeks or whatever your system is, how are you, you know, forget the mm -hmm. observation, forget mm -hmm. everything else. Just start off. How are you holding yourself accountable? What are you collecting? What data are you looking at to hold yourself accountable? And don't tell me smiles or compliance or anything like that, that can mask what someone actually mastered. What I want to know is how are you holding accountable and how are you measuring what you know, whatever it was that was important to learn, how are students learning it? How are you mm. balancing, you know, what you want to teach? Because every human nature is like, well, I want to teach this and I love this. Or when I dust it off from my file cabinet or my now my online files, like they love this, you know, <laughs> five years ago, even last year. How does it apply to now? Right. Have you looked at it? Have you analyzed it? Did you look at the data for things that were going like all of that. And then how are you mitigating racial biases, that invisible smog, that anti-blackness that Dr. Mm. Tatum says everybody is ingesting, digesting, and, and how is it manifesting itself? So how are you interrogating all of that? Mm. What's being taught? How are you holding yourself accountable for learning and how you're addressing the biases that are going throughout? Like, let's start the conversation there you know, before you start telling me about everything is everything else is bad. Let, no, look at tell me what you're doing, what you propose, what you want to do, because I, I can tell you some of my our best teachers. They were constantly assessing mm -hmm. and they didn't run away from stuff. And they would say, like, this is where where Hakeem is now. Here's my goal for Hakeem. Hey, Hakeem, here's what I'm noticing. Here's the pattern. You're noticing this or here's the skill. I think you have this part. You don't have this part. Here's the part. If you're not doing that. Right. Like I just, and you know, I saw some people take it to the extreme, like every standard is on a chart and every kid, if they master, they got it. Like I, you know, I'm not, I don't necessarily get into it that way. Like having this like on the wall, the teacher should know it. Mm -hmm. The teacher should be having individual. And again, time is like everything. You got 150 kids. When do you, you know, but again, this is the master teachers who have that clipboard, who are going around, who are having small conferences, who are going to, you know, all of that. But all of that still goes back to like, making sure that the school is funded well so that folks can have actual planning time and not 40 kids in a class. All of this stuff is all tied into it. But at the end of the day, we're still signing up. We're going in to this burning house. We're the firefighters, our eyes wide open. And don't tell me, like, listen, we're, we're choosing to go in here and do this work, which means starting with our own biases, our low expectations, everything that society has told us about the children that we uh, purportedly love um, and that we're supposed to be serving. And I think it's just, it starts with the mindset, like, okay, I'm, I'm accountable. You know, mm -hmm. and for me, I was never accountable to the standard I test or the state, you know, who I was accountable to, to the community. That's what I internalize. Like I am accountable to this community. I love you. I'm here to serve you. And 
I'm making promises and damn it. Like I'm going to, I'm going to fight like hell to deliver on the promises I'm making to you about your children. Like mm. that, start with that. Start with that. You know, I actually, um, I wish that that would set off a series of questions. Start there and then mm. set off a series of questions that make you question everything, everything else around you and that you're doing before you say stuff like, you expect kids of a certain demography to do poorly on the test. So it's not telling you anything like I just actually need uh, as a parent and a taxpayer, I need public employees to stop um, yelling the words of, uh, of achievement essentialism, which is something I talked about this week, which is you could reduce the essentials of things down to a person's demography. And that tells you, do you know how hella racist you sound when you say all the, the tests tell me is that your parents aren't educated and that you're black and that you um, that you yourself are in in poverty. When I hear that, I hear like that to me is a gong. It's a mm -hmm. gong in my ear of racism. And I don't think they know themselves as liberal people who think they're liberal, who are voting for the Democrats and consider themselves to be consumers of all the great liberal media. They think they're saying something compassionate and what I'm hearing on the outside as an outsider is <laughs> I'm hearing a gong of racism. It's gong it's the shit. loudest. It, it tells me what your mindset is, what it's positions you to think and believe. And it to me, it's damning. You are damning an entire group of kids. And in the group of kids that you're saying that about is a scientist and an orator and an artist and a successful person who is going to have their mind and their future diminished by your essentialist beliefs that demography is destiny and that correlation is causation. And if you are not smart enough to, dis to decouple correlation from, from causation and to decouple kind of like your, your the, what you call the smog of racism that you have grown up in, the water, and you're a fish in racism, so you just don't know it. If you can't decouple that from your practice, if you are not a person who is interrogating your own position within a system that one, um, has low expectations for people of color already, mm. that two, already believes that, that melanin is a deficiency and not a an asset, <laughs> that three, has for years sorted kids into lower tracks of learning for no other reason than they weren't the premium kids of the system. And by premium, I mean the white kids with two college educated parents who when something goes wrong for them, you blame the system, not them. When something goes wrong for us, you blame us, not the system, right? When you have a, a situation where a report comes out like TNTPs and it tells you that for years you have been um, assigning the wrong grade level assignments to our kids. Um, when you have reports and information come out that says many of our kids are more gifted than the system even knows and their teachers even know. And the one reason they're not getting into gifted education is because it's, it's dependent on a teacher referral. And, and you're being told that when kids have black teachers, they're referred more to gifted uh, and, and they qualify for it. Um, when you're being told that um, black children, when they have two black teachers in a row, it changes their trajectory. You have to stop blaming demography, zip codes, race, and income when there's so much to indict your own system on and your position within the system. Just because you vote the right way, just because you wear all the liberal t-shirts, just because you have Black Lives Matter on your Twitter handle and your Twitter feed, just because you went to professional development 18 times in a row and preached the gospel of Ikande uh, uh, and, and now have become an anti-racist consumer of information and whatnot, does not mean you've interrogated your practice. And you, you definitely have not interrogated your language and your message to the public when you say things like standardized tests don't tell us anything you didn't know. You are lying when you say that. I can put you on the spot and ask you, okay, let's go through all 150 of your students or 30 of your students, and you tell me where each one of them is supposed to land, number one, based on their own potential, whether they're reaching it or not, um, and 
how they are judged against the students in your class and the teacher in class next to you, right? Oftentimes, you have three math teachers in a school and two of those teachers are doing better than one of the teachers and nobody asks a question why. Nobody ever stops and says, okay, we all three teach the same grade level and your kids are getting this much information in the first four months of, of the year and, and you're not. So, uh, oh, well, you know, shit, I mean, I don't know. I don't like data. I don't know. <laughs> Throw the data out. God it's damn the it. kids. They got, yeah, I'd be a much kids. better classroom if I had different kids. If I had different kids. <laughs> I, had, I had a teacher union president once say to me about school choice, if you want to sc choose schools, let us choose our students. And I'm like, well, damn, seniority, actually, the way that you bid into jobs actually has already given you that right in many districts. But anyways, that's my final word on all of this. There is a more professional way to talk about this. I didn't get to this Edutopia article that really talks about data driven instruction in a way to me that seems totally apolitical and just straight up like, you know, it's about professional development, determining essential potential standards, uh, creating high quality interim assessments developing a system for creating data reports, create a process for data analysis, and follow up on reteaching, uh, and reflect and develop buy-in. And, and you know, I put this article in the comments. Um, we didn't get there, but to me, we didn't get there because this to me seems like the apolitical way to talk about data um, driven instruction, but the way that educators, their unions, and their you know, the parents that actually support them in being anti-scientists, uh, um, the way they talk about it is just, it's political and we can't get out of it. We're in a cycle of that. So anyway, Sharif, I will give you the final word on this. I, I you know, I have my rant from the outside and that's it. You just heard what it is. Um, what's your final word on it? Listen, I, I co-sign <laughs> on what you said. And I think at the end of the day, and we you know, keep revisiting uh, these statistics because I think it's really important as people are talking about whether it's Gadfly, Gadfly or whoever, um, most over 60% of, of teachers will say that they felt unprepared to engage students in meaningful learning, right? And so if you can't engage students in meaningful learning, and if 62% say they felt unprepared to teach culturally diverse students, you put those two together. I'm unprepared to teach you know, for meaningful learning, to engage students in meaningful learning, to lead a classroom effectively, and I'm unprepared to teach black and brown kids, you put that together and then also say, yeah, you know what? I don't want any accountability. Don't observe me. <laughs> you know, I'm telling you, I'm not prepared, but just leave me alone. I'll figure it out. You know, even if I, this might be the, the third generation, you know, that I'm, you know, uh, teaching, but I'm, you know, I'll figure it out eventually. Um, and so I, I think people have to embrace accountability. Like to me, that's what, stop telling me you love our children, but you shirk, shun accountability. Like that doesn't, mm -hmm. that doesn't match. That, that, I mean, there's such a gap between your understanding of, of the world, uh, human beings, uh, potential and what you're, what you're doing. And so I would say, you know, uh, folks embrace data find ways you know um to hold yourself accountable find ways to improve your craft uh find that tribe find a teacher who's better than you and learn what are they doing in the classroom and outside of the classroom what do they do with their planning what do they do in with their uh delivery how are they thinking about it right like so you know, everybody should have like a Nadir Suleiman, you know, who's mm -hmm. constantly assessing their how they're teaching, what they're going to do differently, who needs what, who needs more what, all of that constantly. Everybody, and, and I could just name, I can just name over and over and over again, you know, uh, teachers at that caliber. Um, but there are not enough of them. We need more teachers like that who are who are scientists, who are you know, uh, you know science about this craft, you know, and, and understanding this is how children learn. This is where the bar is. And I'm holding myself accountable and how this is how we're going to do it as a collective. Like, it doesn't mean that they're mm -hmm. on a, like, mm -hmm. Hey, I know I'm going to partner with a family. I need, I know I need to build relationships. I know I need outside feedback. Like these are teachers who would say, Hey, come observe me telling their peers, Hey, I'm gonna try this lesson. And this is what I'm trying to get come watch and give me feedback about what you think. Did I deliver it? And then we'll look at the assessments together. But I'm teaching eighth grade. I'm also going to ask the ninth grade teacher, like, hey, will this prepare them for ninth grade? Will this prepare them for high school if I continue on this thread? 
Those are all the questions and assessments that are people doing. But the number one thing is assess your own skills, assess mm -hmm. your own mindset. Mm -hmm. Then tell me, tell me where that is. And then let's talk about the, the outside assessments. I, I, I'm actually listening to you as I talk, as you talk. And I think that's where I am. And I think I would, uh, I think there's a p part of this that always gets missed <laughs> and I miss it all the time because I think I just assume it's assumed already. We're always talking about individual teachers, but uh, principals and school leaders, this is ultimately like landing on your, on your doorstep. Absolutely. Just, but like the more we talk about teachers, the less we're talking about you. And um, yeah, I fall into that trap all the time talking about teachers, but uh, rarely giving enough credence to the fact that um, <laughs> like, listen, uh, crappy principles make make things terrible for everybody, right? right? Right. The difference between a good principal and an average principal can be a, have a colossal impact on on the mm. student outcomes. It's good and average, let alone bad, right? Like just yeah, to say, like yeah. most people are average. The difference between a good principal and a strong leadership team, mm -hmm. as opposed to an average principal and an average leadership team, I mean the the amount of impact that that has on children is colossal and if we and you know we talk about the three point whatever million teachers all the time but well, as we used to tell you know when we were principal ambassador fellows what we used to tell uh the u.s department of ed all the principles of a public school uh, the public school system in america can fit in a large football stadium mm. you're talking about a hundred thousand right michigan's mm -hmm, football mm -hmm. team stadium fits a hundred thousand people that's mm. all the principles if you can't make sure that every that we have a hundred thousand out of all these people, out of the millions of people in America, we can't get a hundred thousand fantastic principles. Like everything else is like shot to hell. Crazy. <laughs> well, you know what? Actually, that's next week's show. Let's do it right there in a nutshell. That actually because uh, that leads us to a point where I think is uh, it's undiscovered territory. Um, um, because I think they're living on, they're living underneath the cover of how much heat we have for teachers. So they get to kind of like be out of that a little bit. Um, and no one's actually saying, no, no, no. Okay, it's your turn now. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm gonna see if Dr. C can return for this because she's one of the Perfect. she's one of the baddest principals I ever had the honor of working with. And there's it's so many of them out there, but she captures a whole lot. Um, as a principal. So hopefully, you know, um, if she can, we'll, we'll find somebody else that can also bring this perspective as a sitting uh, principal yeah. about like how they're going through the work, you know, uh, maybe like Dr. Will Hayes or somebody, you know, these, these young sharp, the young ones, uh, yeah, right. the, the bow tie principles, you know, we got a, we got a, we got a group of bow tie principles. All right. All right. Well, listen, this has been another uh, episode of Unpublic. It's been another Freedom Friday and you are still not free, but hopefully you're freer now at the end of this hour than you were when you started the hour. Love it that you all come and share your time with us in the morning to talk about education as if it matters, because it does matter. It's our kids and it's the future. And um, I want all justice loving people, people who are justice loving people to realize that these conversations and the things that we are trying to figure out are not about arguments. They're not about politics. They're literally about whether or not children are going to have a better life um, this year, 12 years from now and 15 years from now and 20 years from now. And all the things that we complain about and worry about now, the, the wealth gap, the home, home ownership gap, the um, disparate um, um, outcomes in health and in in um in civics and the way that we're treated georgia just passed a law yesterday that makes it harder to vote in georgia which is like uh, jim crow 2.0 um are we still going to be arguing about those things 15 20 and 30 years from now uh we'll probably be arguing about all those things less if we are taking our time today to train the real revolution. The real revolution exists within the brains and the hearts of our young people in our schools right now. If you want a better world, the way that you can make it happen is holding yourself to a very high bar of making sure that they have every weapon necessary to beat a country that is going to use data and use laws and rules and procedures to box them out of opportunity 
and to box them out of the life that they deserve. So if you are a teacher and educator, that literally means that people are becoming taught and educated um, because of your practice. And if they're not, you're a student of education. You become an educator the day that you are raising the revolution by making sure that those kids are getting everything that they need in their classroom to go to the next grade level and proceed from white belt all the way to black belt so that when they come out of high school, they're capable of doing something that frees themselves and frees their people. That's my final word. Thank you all for watching. We appreciate you. Come back again next week. We're going to have a great conversation 